Daniel, David, Jay, Isabel, and my awesome wife, Angela, for uh, coming up and blessing us with worship and music. I tell you, um, never before have I been moved by lyrics um, like these lyrics. It felt like I needed to hear the message in this music. Amen? Amen. Again, welcome. I'm glad that everyone is here today. Before we begin, I want to invite you all for a word of prayer. Let's just bow our heads. Father in heaven, we ask now for your Holy Spirit. Lord, you are so good. All the time you answer our prayers and you stand up for us. And Lord, we know that in this world, as we try to accomplish things and do things that we deem successful, Lord, we're often asked the question, are we doing your will? Are we fulfilling your purpose? So Lord, guide us today as we uncover what your truth has regarding this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So again, I want to um, just say that I'm super excited that we have a lot of young adults today. Um, those of you who don't know, Young Adult Sabbath travels around the Arizona Conference, and we just happen to have it on um, today at Chandler. And I want to see this more on a weekly basis. How about you? Um, you see, the, God's truth is not just for the kids, and it's not just for the old, but it's also for those of us who are young adults. Amen? Amen. And um, even though I'm getting up in years, I consider myself still an adult that's still very young. And, um, and many people try to guess my age. I don't, you can try to take a lottery and see what, what you think I am. But remember, my family's from Hawaii, so I look much younger than I, uh, I look, I hope. I hope. <laughs> Amen. Thank you for that. I'll pay you later. Um, I have some people here that I've, I um, need to acknowledge. I just um, went to Thunderbird Adventist Academy's um, final game, and they were at ASU, and they won the state championship, the first time ever for Thunderbird Adventist Academy. So I have Thunderbird Adventist Academy watching. Let's give them a round of applause. And um, it was awesome because um, they had to stop the, the game in the fourth inning of a thing called the mercy rule. I didn't know there was a, such a thing as a mercy rule. But by the fourth inning, um, the score was already 32 or 34 to 9. Or, or, and so they said, we need to end the game um, out of mercy. And I thought, wow, how awesome is that to end the game out of mercy? I would have been curious to see what it would have been at the end of the seventh, maybe 100 to 9 or something. But uh, they, were, they were just dominant. It was awesome. And so while I was there, I had a chance to talk and meet with a, a person who went to Ukraine with my brother, Dr. Troy Anderson. And uh, that's Chris Colson. I see him there. He raised his hand. I'm so glad that you made it back safely from Ukraine. He was in the war zone. He's a young adult that put himself out on the line. And um, the question that we got to talking about at this ball game while TAA was just completely creaming this other team was, what is God's purpose? How do we know what God's purpose was? And I got a lot of intel from him. And so um, um, today we're going to be looking at the question, the fundamental question that not just young adults ask, but even those of us who are older and those who are in high school as they're going to life is, what is God's purpose in my life? What does God want me to do? What is God's purpose and will for my grandkids? What is God's purpose for my brother, my sister, my children? And so what I'd like to do is turn to the scripture to ask that question and find the answers. Now, one of the things that we, we um, um, will notice, and um, I'm going to ask my AV team if you can just advance the slide for me because this doesn't seem to be working for me. So thank you so much for advancing that. Um, there was a study that was recently done by Forbes magazine and Time magazine. You all know those magazines. They're, they're, they're famous. You see them in, the, in Walmart. You'll see them in the stores. You can buy these magazines at airports. And it was based on a study that was done by Ohio State University asking the question, what are the greatest desires that people have but cannot attain? What are the greatest desires that people have but cannot be attained? And Forbes magazine and Time magazine created a list. Now, if you go on the internet today, you will see, if you just type in um, what are people's greatest desires, you're going to see this list pop up. 
and they are nine different things that people want in life. So let's take a look at this list. All right, number one, go ahead and advance the slide. People look for a long, peaceful life. Now, some people say, I want to live forever. But, you know, Gulliver Travels, if you read the book, there was an island that he came upon where people were living forever, but they got old and decrepit. Now, imagine living a life old and decrepit. You can't move. You're, you're, um, you can't even, you, can't, you don't have a quality life. Well, what people want today is a life that is long, but a peaceful life. And so we can add to that. Number two, the second thing that people look for is quality years. So as we, as we go on through life, starting from college and you start to, to discover things as you're getting older, you begin to realize that you're not immortal. So you want these long years, but you want them to be peaceful and you want to have quality in those years. Amen? That's what we look for. Okay, another part of a desire that people ask for. Number three, let's take a look at that. They look for true love. How many of you are looking for true love? right? Some of us are single. Some of you are, are, are looking for that soulmate. And when you're looking for true love, the number one thing that you're looking for, thank you so much, is faithful love. Someone that is going to be faithful through thick and thin, right? Someone that is a person that will be with you, whether you're sick or poor. I mean, we're talking about true, long, enduring, faithful love, right? That doesn't just end with true love's first kiss, okay? You want something that when you're old and you're already in years and, and you're coming to your spouse and you, and you know, I wanna kiss, honey, and, and then they say, okay, hold on, let me put my dentures in. <laughs> Otherwise, they'll be kissing you like, right? We want, we want something that is beyond the physical. We want something that is meaningful from inside, right? We don't want something that's on the surface because we could be attracted to someone on the surface, but just wait a few more years down the road, and that beauty starts to fade away. So it has to be a beauty from the inside. And this is what, what, what Time Magazine was saying, that people are not looking only for love, they're looking for a true love that has faith and, and long-lasting love. Now, the fourth thing is that people look for great success. Great success, and we measure success many different ways. Okay, for me, I measure success um, just getting my Honda minivan to start and make it here without overheating, okay? My brother, Dr. Troy Anderson, he measures success by the, um, how low his 50 series low profile tires can handle a road at 100 miles an hour. He's driving a BMW, you know, that's his measure of success. And he says, oh yeah, God is good. It's like, okay, well, why isn't God good to me that way, you know? <laughs> Is that a measure of success? So we're going to ask the question, what is our measure of success? The fifth thing that people look for is an effective and efficient straight pathway to success without meandering along the road of life. You know how it is. I, when I was growing up, I was planning to go to medical school. Dr. Jennings, I was planning to be a doctor. But God didn't call me to be a doctor, so I took some time out, and I went and got a master's degree. So I got an MBA degree, then I went to law school, and God kept moving me around, and he said, you know what? I need you to do something else for me. I, I, I kid you not, being a pastor was the last thing on my mind. You see, I didn't want to be a pastor. The gospel ministry didn't, wasn't appealing to me. But God called me to it. You see, so God had some other plan for me, and so I was able to track on God and, and finally release all of these desires that I had for my own life. You know, I'm the guy, how many of you have a five-year plan? Do y'all know what about a five-year plan is? Okay, I was the guy that had a 15-year plan. So what I did is I actually created a resume on what I wanted my resume to look like. I would go to Princeton University. I would have so many experiences and externships in biomedical services and research, okay? I, I, I actually knew exactly what schools I wanted to go to. I made the plans, but God had a different plan for me. And the way I measured my success was whether I was meeting the goals of my resume. And guess what? My resume today is nothing like what it looked like when I started in high school. And so what Forbes magazine said was as they polled all these CEOs, one of the things that they were looking for, people are looking for, is an effective 
and efficient, straight pathway to your success. You don't want to meander. You want to get right to it, right? That's what we desire. Okay, let's take a look at the sixth um, issue or the sixth greatest desire of people. Good health and vitality. Good health and vitality. Now, our measure of health today is totally different than it was, like, say, back in the 1980s. You know, back in the 1980s, health and vitality was just being able to, to last in, the, in, in dancing for at least two or three hours, okay? No, they weren't into the, the, the things that we're into today. So back in, in the 1980s, health and vitality was measured by how many of those Jane Fonda Pilates yoga things you can do, right? Suzanne Summers had the thing where you would do the squeezy thing with your legs, okay? Back in the 1970s, they had a little roller. If you wanted to lose fat, what you would do is you'd turn this machine on and it would start rolling, and you would have to sit on it and go <laughs> like this. Oh, I'm losing fat because it's getting itchy. You remember that? Did anyone ever do that? Okay, or is it just my family that did that? Okay, this, this is why I'm fat up here and really skinny down here. <laughs> kidding, kidding. Today, how do we want good health and vitality? Well, we go to the gym, and they have a new thing now called uh, CrossFit. So it's no longer okay just to sit there and do the, the weight on the training. You know, you get on the treadmill and you start running, right? And you say, oh man, I'm, I, can, I can increase my speed. I'm going three miles an hour, right? Three, no, no laughs yet? Okay, three miles an hour is super slow. Okay, so you take it up to four and you start to do a slow jog walk, right? And you start to increase your speed and you say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure I can do a, a 5K. See, we measure our success whether we can accomplish a 5K, then a 10K, then a marathon, or a half marathon, then a marathon, okay? And after we accomplish that, I'm going to get into CrossFit. So CrossFit is, is where you take these big tires, and you lift them, and you try to push them over to the other side of the room. And by the time you get to the other side of the room, you're going, whew, man, I'm, I'm fit. I'm fit. Okay, when's the last time you had to move a tire in your life? Right? They're trying to work out the whole body, though. That's the, that's the thing. So this is what we're looking for. We're looking for something that will give us good health, but not just good health, but that we're vi we have vitality, right? That we're, like, we have energy. We have vigor in life. Okay? How many of you woke up this morning, and you're like, oh, I got bags under my eyes. I got to stick some of that power drink into me. Drink a monster truck or a coffee, and all of a sudden, zing. Right? And then by the end of the day, you're, I need another coffee or something, right? Is that what we mean by vitality? Or is it getting up here and just having a good time? Okay, so we're going to see what the Bible says about having a, vit a, a life of vitality. The seventh thing that people desire was the ability to provide for their family or provide for themselves. Now, more so now today, than the past. This is becoming more and more an issue. For example, you all know that when you go to the supermarket now, you, you may or you may not be successful in finding your favorite bread, right? Or you might be going to a place like Sam's Club or Costco, and you say, I'm going to buy myself a 25-pound bag of flour, only to discover that there's no flour left there. Okay, so, so this issue of providing for our family is becoming more and more of a problem today. How many of you had to fill up with gasoline yesterday or today to come to church? Anyone pay less than $10? No? No? Okay, anyone pay less than $20? If you do, I, I need to know what vehicle you're driving. Okay, maybe an electric vehicle? No, no dollars? Okay. I had to put gas in my vehicle, and it cost over $30 just to fill up quarter tank. Okay, quarter tank to half tank. Okay, and remember, this is the same car. I'm praying that I can make it to church without it exploding and overheating. Okay, I have a concern that everyone shares, and that is, can we provide for myself? Can I provide for my wife and my new coming family? Okay, these are issues that people desire. They want security in life. The next thing that they're looking for, the eighth thing, according to this magazine and all over the internet, is people look for wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom and knowledge. The ability to get educated and have dreams of having a bachelor's degree, then a master's degree. Move on to a doctoral degree, do some research, 
have a, a level of success. These are things that we all um, think about. If we can't achieve it, then we want our kids to do something better than what we did, right? My dad, he, he graduated only third grade. He was very poor. He had to work. So he put all of, our, all of us, all of us kids through school. And this is why we're so highly educated, because my dad wasn't. It's called um, evolution of a family. We do better than our, our parents. Hopefully my kids will do better than me. Maybe they'll become the president of the United States. Oh, oh I hope Jesus comes by then, right? <laughs> or maybe they'll be something else. Maybe they'll be a physician. Maybe they'll be a pastor. Maybe they'll do something in graphic design arts and do something in ministry. Now that's, now you're talking, for me at least. But wisdom and knowledge is one of those great desires. And finally, the ninth greatest desire sought after by people is for meaningful relationships. Now, let me ask this question, because there are three different categories. I'm talking about not just a relationship. How many of you have acquaintances? Acquaintances, we all have acquaintances, right? These are just people you know their names, like, hey, how you doing? It's just, you know, pass and go. But you, you, you don't know anything about that person. We have a lot of acquaintances. Okay, how many of you have friends? Friends. We have a good friends, right? We hang out together as a, as a group. This group up here, we're, we're all friends. We're friends. How many of you actually have best friends? Best friends. Like, I'm talking about you're willing to go and you, you do everything together. You, you travel together. You put your life down together. You know, um, Chris, you went to Ukraine. And I'm sure some of the people who your best friends are, you would, you would lay down your life if something happened. If, if a Russian soldier had, or I don't mean to be political, if any soldier had a gun up, okay, had a gun up, would you, would you just sit there and let that person get shot? Okay, I'm glad you said no. Thank you. Thank you for that. Because if you would have said, yeah, I would have been worried. Okay, but... But no, you would, have, you, would have said, you would have tried to save that person. These are meaningful type relationships. These relationships carry over into our family. They carry over into brothers and sisters. We have relationships with our siblings. This is why you anguish over their downfall when they make bad choices, right? Because you had a meaningful relationship and you want something better for them. Okay, now, as we take a look at this list, long, peaceful life, quality years, true love, faithful love, great success, an effective and efficient straight path to that success. I'm looking for good health and vitality. Provide for family. I want wisdom and knowledge to be able to do all these things. And lastly, I want meaningful relationships. So what do we do as humans? Here's what we normally do as we are graduating out of high school and we're getting into college. Okay, as we look at this list and you're now going into the corporate world and the business world, you start to work out, right? You start to build yourself up. You're starting to rely, you see the strength that you build and you're starting to see success. You get that degree. You discover that, man, that bachelor's degree was hard earned. I'm gonna go for a master's degree. And then I'm gonna go for a PhD. I'm gonna go to law school, even though taking the LSAT was super hard. That was a success, just being able to pass the LSAT and get into law school or medical school with the MCAT. Okay, not easy, not everyone can do these things. Or going into seminary and becoming a pastor, it's not easy being a pastor. But we see, we measure our, our abilities to achieve all these desires by doing things that we want to do. Then you get that job. You get that corporate job, and man, you're, you're cutting the deals. You're, you're making the company a lot of money. And your measure of success is all of the awards that are hanging, hanging on the wall and the trophies of how many uh, sales you made, right? Then we um, start to look at our bank account. When we were in high school, our bank account was how much mom and dad gave me in an allowance. Now you're actually making real money. And you don't even know what to do with all those thousands of dollars. So what do you do? Okay, you get that freedom. You start making the money. Now you, you're not eating well anymore. Now you're going to McDonald's. Okay, when you go into a supermarket, what are you buying? You're not buying the healthy stuff that mom and dad bought. You want, you're buying Doritos and ice cream. Right? This is why they call it the freshman, eight, uh, the, what do they call that? The 18... What is it? Freshman 15. Y'all heard about the freshman 15? See, when, when, a, when an 18-year-old gets independence from mom and dad, and they're in, 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 um, in college now, they gain 15 pounds. And the reason why they gain 15 pounds is because they're eating all the junk food that they weren't allowed to eat when they were at home. 
So they call it the freshman 15, okay? For me, I'm much older now, and I call it the um, 40 pounds overweight. Because <laughs> all I do is eat all the good stuff. So I have to be reminded of things. But money does weird things to people, right? Then we get married, we build a family, and we say, wow, this is amazing. We go to the ocean, we're enjoying the sunset, we are being really successful. But then something weird happens. As we're there with our friends, and we're, we're having these relationships, we begin to see that through the years, one year, three years, five, seven, ten years, these are the big markers, we begin to see that the very things that we desire begin to fall apart. So we start to see that we're, as we're aging, we get muscle cramps. We start to get injuries in sports. We realize that we can't rely 100% on things that we can do with our bodies. And so we now have to start going to a doctor who tells me now I have diabetes risk. And so I have to start going on medications. Or maybe I have a family history of cancer or a family history of heart um, problems. So I now have to start taking medications. And so we realize that the very desire I want for a healthy life starts to fall apart because of things outside of me. And then that, that corporate job that we have, we get the infamous pink slip. They have to downslice. Because of the pandemic, they had to let people go. We had to close down our shop. And these are things completely outside of our control. These are things that we um, didn't decide for ourselves, but it's the way of the world. And now we begin to see our dreams begin to fall apart. And as we look at trying to manage our finances, all the money that we attain are now starting to go into a mortgage payment. Anyone try buying a house lately? Okay, you can get maybe a one or two bedroom apartment and you're paying about $2,000 a month. So you say, I'm gonna go ahead and buy a house. So you go and try to put a house down, but you realize you have to put $20,000 down for a house. You might get 2.75% interest rate, but good luck trying to find a house in this market. There are no houses to be had anymore. Okay, so things are really, really getting to the point where we don't have these, the, 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 the power to have the success that we want because of outside influences. And so we start to look at our finances and we discover that some of us might have to file bankruptcies. That marriage that you thought was really solid, that faithful, true love had a, a, a point because you didn't really know that person. And all of a sudden, when it came down to it, spiritually, you weren't walking together. So the very things that drew you together are now pulling you apart to the point where we start to say, that's it for me. I'm done with it. And we see the divorce rate increasing more and more. And these very friends who we relied on start to go their own way, and we start to have disagreements because some of us have to take a path that may not be in line with what your friendships used to be like. So what is the answer? As we sit and we ask the question, what does God want from me? Why do things keep happening and am I on the right path? Is my brother making the right decision? Is my sister making the right decision? Are my children doing what God's will is for them? And as we sit and we contemplate, some of us are like this individual on the, on the photo, we're, we're depressed, we sit alone in our room, and the question is, is, why am I even here? How many of you heard of all the recent suicides lately? It doesn't matter what your, what your success is in life. For example, Naomi Judd. Just got inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame on Monday, but she committed suicide on Friday before that. So her measure of success was something that was outside of, of, of herself, but she needed something a little bit more that could keep her hanging on. And this is where we find ourselves today. Well, I'd like to propose to you this morning that as we ask this question, what is God's purpose for me? That we can actually find the answer in the scriptures. Now, before we begin, and I'm going to go real fast through this, I want you to be reminded of a text, and I want you to write this text down. It's found in Psalm 138, verse 8. And this is a promise that God makes to all of us today. But this is particularly true for those of us who are just starting out in life, those of us who are in the middle of our careers, and those of us who are trying to ask the question, what is God's purpose for me? And this is a promise that God makes. The Lord will fulfill 
his purpose for me. Now, I want you to, to, to think about what this text says. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. You see, I think right away, the assumption here is when you are in a deep relationship with God and God is your friend, and you start to conform your will over to God, you begin to discover what God's will is for you. You see? So it's not about what is your will. The question should be, what is God's will, and how can I conform or how can God fulfill his will in me? And only then can I be truly happy. You see, when you're living a life in Christ, when you're living a life in conformity to God, only then will we have the, the, the satisfaction and the peace. And if you don't believe it, I'm going to prove it to you out of Proverbs. So let's take a look at Proverbs chapter 3. Now, you remember the first thing that Forbes and Time magazine and the study out of Ohio State University said is that the, the two top things that people look for are long, peaceful life and quality years. Right? How many of you desire that? A long, peaceful life with quality years. Okay, let's take a look at Proverbs chapter 3, and let's start right at the top. My son or daughter, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart. So right away, I want you to think about this. God gave us some teachings, and God gave us some commands, and he's pulling us back to what was ancient. He's pulling us back to Scripture saying, if you want some things, you have to go back to God's teachings. You have to go back to God's commands. And take them into your heart. And here's the result. For they will prolong your life many years. Whoa. And it will bring you peace and prosperity. So what God is telling us is if you truly want a long, peaceful life, if you truly want quality years, God is saying you have to go on a little journey. You're like Indiana Jones and you're going on a little adventure quest. You have to start to go into some dark tunnels. You have to start opening some doors that you're not comfortable with. Because you see, whenever we say God's laws, God's teachings, and God's commands, all of a sudden we begin to shut down. It, it seems like it's something that we can't do. And we're not willing to go forward and discover what God is actually trying to tell us. But God is saying if you have the courage to discover in Scripture what God is trying to teach us, and what God is trying to command us to do, one result leads to a second result. And we start with a prolonged life of many years that will be filled with peace and prosperity. Now, I don't know if you know, but how many of you know these really old, ancient people that live in their 80s and 90s? And you know when they walk around, they're really slow, and they sit down, and then you ask, you, you, you know, when they, when they talk, it's like honey that drips off of the honeycomb, man. Every word is measured, and it feels like you're, you're, you're listening for gold. You all know a person like that? Okay, here's one thing that you'll always, I, I guarantee you, they will always say, the Lord is good. I remember all the time how the Lord has brought me salvation. Let me tell you my story. And they'll go on, and you can listen to them, and let me tell you something. They are the most peaceful, the most chill, the most wise people, and they're living years that mean a lot. You all know that? You know, that's the kind of person I want to be when I get older. You know, I don't want to be that old fool, you know, that people come around, and I'm sitting there saying, you know, what? Where are you going? Get me get my stick. Come here. Come here. Let me get it. You know, you know people like that. The old, the, some people, are, they just don't learn from life. I want to be the guy, you know, when my, when my son or my daughter gets up and says, this song I'm going to sing for you, I want to dedicate to my dad. You know, who taught me everything about God. Dad, can you stand up? And I'll be the old guy, you know, I'm, I'm sitting down and... <laughs> right? You've seen people like this, right? Prolonged life with many years of peace and prosperity, and you're thankful for what God has done for you. You see, I want to be the guy that's grateful. And when people come and they, they say, hey, do you want to talk to Pastor Anderson? You got to go into his garden, man. That's where he's at. And you come in, I'm there with all my roses and all my, my tomatoes, and you hear the music to Godfather. No, I'm just kidding. Okay? 
And then when they ask me questions, I'll say, turn to Exodus. You know, you want to be that wise person like that. Well, God says, go back to his teachings, go back to his commandments if you want a long, peaceful, quality life. But he doesn't stop there. You remember, this study said that as people look for things in life, they look for true love that has faith involved, faithful love, and they want to measure their life with great success. Well, take a look at what Proverbs in the next verses 3 and 4 have to say. When you look to God's commandments, when you look to God's teachings, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Okay, so he's talking about a kind of love that we're all looking for, a love that is steadfast, a love that is faithful. And, and here's the thing. God says is when you find that love, bind that around your neck, write them on the tablets of your heart. And you think, okay, maybe they're talking about God here. But God is talking about something different. Look at verse 4. So you will find favor and good success not only in the sight of God, but also with who? With man. So what we're talking about is a kind of success that is, is something that you can't see. So how many of you have, have heard the, the, the age-old story, the person that's looking for love in all the wrong places? You know, I've been looking for love in all the wrong places. And you're looking for that beautiful blonde that wears those nice tight jeans or, or you know, you measure your, the, the beauty of a person based on what they look like and what they wear. And your best friend, you know, Mary, who you grew up with, who would die for you, who was loyal for you, you know, you would talk to that person, you would, you know, tell all your problems to that person. You're looking for love and love was sitting there all the time. How many of you look and judge for a, a soulmate in a bar? Okay, brother, I saw you raise your hand. You can put it down. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay, yeah. Two hands up, guilty. But you're here in church today. You realize that you don't find love in places like that, right? You got to look for something else. You got to look for something that's deeper. And this is why God says, make sure that when you are together, that you are e equally yoked which means that you are spiritually resonating with that person. And here it says, you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. And this is uh, for men. Here's, here's the important thing. You got to choose the right woman. And here's why. Because that woman's going to be the crown on your, on, uh, the jewel on your crown. You know, they represent you. And you want someone that represents you. Not someone that's going to uh, do things that make you do bad things. And it goes the other way around too. Women choose a guy that brings you closer to God and, and really brings your values out and not someone that makes you make bad choices. Okay? It's not okay to date somebody who starts talking bad about your mom and dad. It's not okay to date someone who starts to say, man, you ought to, you ought to just enforce this thing about, you know, tell everyone get out of the house because that house belongs to you. Okay, that's none of their business. As soon as they start putting divisions among your family, you know that you're in the wrong pathway. Definitely don't go with someone that says, hey, let's go out and party. I'm going to sit in your lap and let's go 130 miles an hour on the freeway. You know what I'm saying? You don't know what I'm saying? I guarantee you there's someone who's watching right now that knows exactly what I'm saying. Okay, because they've done it. They've done it. 130 miles an hour while they're sitting on the lap. Tell you what, I ought to slap that person in the head. But I'll leave that to God. I'll leave that to God. You know who I'm talking to. You're watching online right now. Okay, I don't mean to point anyone out. <laughs> All right, the fifth thing, an effective and efficient straight path to success. You know, we want that straight path we don't want to waste our time. Look at what it says in verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. You all know this verse. Do not lean on your own understanding. Because you see, God has the big picture. We only have a myopic view. We only know what we see in front of us. In all your ways, acknowledge who? God. So right away, God's saying, if you want all of these things in your heart, you've got to put your focus on God. Didn't Jesus say the same thing? Seek ye first the kingdom of who? God. And all the what? These things... And his righteousness and all these things, what? Will be added to you. Well, here we see. In all your ways, acknowledge God, and he will make straight your path. You know, I think that maybe if I was growing up, if I would have just listened to God, I knew I was dedicated at the ocean. 
I knew that God, um, that, that my dad and my mom gave me the firstborn over to God and said, Lord, I want to dedicate Ed Jr. to you. I should have known that God was going to use me in some capacity, like what I'm doing today. If I would have accepted that, I probably would have been doing a lot more today. But you see, I wasted a lot of years going to law school, although lately I've been dealing with the law a lot lately. Not me, but others. Okay, I, I confess. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. But you get what I'm saying. Sometimes if we make choices and decisions with God, God will make straight our path. We don't have to waste some time. And we can, we can do things that God asks us to do. Now let's take a look at this next one here. Good health and vitality. I kid you not, the Bible says this. Take a look at what it says. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Okay, so in other words, God is saying, don't rely 100% on what you think you know. Rather, turn to God, turn away from evil, and you will be blessed. Now, what are the evils of the world? We already know that if you drink too much alcohol, you're going to have an evil result. You'll get drunk, you'll get a DUI, you end up in prison, and all of a sudden you're crying to the Lord, Lord, why did you do this to me? God didn't put the alcohol in your glass. God didn't make that decision for you to go in the car while you were drunk. Those are consequences that we make ourselves. So why do we blame God for choices that we make, the evil of our world and the choices that we make, and we all of a sudden blame God? No, God says, be wise. Don't look at yourself. Look and turn to God and turn away from these evil things, and it will be a healing component to your flesh. Did you know that the Bible says that there are some health laws? He tells us what not to eat. He tells us what not to drink. He tells us when we should rest and how much we should rest. He tells us that he created the sun so we can get sunshine. Do you know that if a person um, stayed indoors their whole life and never got exposed to sun, sunlight, what would they suffer from? Vitamin D deficiency. Okay, the sailors. Why did they keep oranges on, on their, their ships? Because they would get scurvy. You know, God created all these things. He says, follow my teachings, follow my laws, and they will be refreshment to your bones. Refreshment to your bones. So here we see that the Bible has some answers. But the question is, is where do we find them? Ah, you need to start reading your Bible to find the answers to, the, to these successes. Okay, let's look at the next one. Number seven, provide for your family. Okay, many of us are worried about that today. We have a big famine coming. There's famine all around the world because of what's happening in Ukraine. We don't have fertilizer. Um, the markets are now um, without flour. So we have an issue now. How do we provide for our family? Honor the Lord with your wealth. Wow, I can honor the Lord in many ways, but I didn't realize that we can honor God in our wealth. Guess what? Nothing belongs to you. You came into the world with nothing. You will leave the world with nothing. Anything that you have is because God gave it to you. Even the ability to acquire wealth, your mind and your degrees, all of these things God gave to you so that way you can acquire your wealth. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. In other words, everything that you get belongs to the Lord. So honor God with the first fruits of everything. It's not just money, but it's your children, it's your house, it's your clothes. It's your health. Everything that you're about belongs to God, so honor God with the first fruits of that produce. Then, look at, the, look at the result. Your barns will be filled with plenty. Now, they're using old language because back then, they had barns that were empty. Here it says, barns will be filled with plenty. So let's put it in modern day language. Your pantries will be filled with lots of food. Your bank accounts will have some money. Okay, and notice what it says here. Your vats, you know what a vat is? It's like one of those things that hold, you know, liquids. But a vat is different. It holds wine. It says vats will be bursting with wine. Now, if you're an Adventist Christian, here's what you, it, I would read. Your pantries will be filled with lentils and beans and gluten-based plant products from La Loma and Worthington brand. You will have cases and cases of fried chick and scallops and big franks. And rather than your vats, okay, here's gonna say, your refrigerator and all your, your liquid containers will be filled with soy milk. 
Okay, here's the thing. I like it better from the Bible. I want my vats to be bursting with wine. <laughs> I don't even drink wine. I can't say I get headaches when I drink wine. But it's going to be filled with something that I enjoy. Now, here's what God says. If you honor God, you are going to be able to provide for your family. You are going to provide, and you have to trust that God is going to do that for you. Let's take a look at wisdom and knowledge. Now, wisdom and knowledge, God took some time on this. And I want to say a word about this. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him who he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. You see, some of us are going to go through things that God needs to take us down on our knees. Anyone experience this? Okay, we might go through some stuff that we have to turn to God. And then we see that God is just trying to teach me something. So we have to be able and willing to accept God's teaching. And when we start to understand, we start this pathway, this journey to achieve knowledge and wisdom. So look at what it says. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom. Wisdom is the application of what you know. So you can acquire all this knowledge, and then as soon as you know how to apply that knowledge to something, that's called wisdom. Okay, blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. So that's knowledge. For the gain from her is better than gain from silver, and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire can compare with her. And look at the result of this. When you can have wisdom and knowledge, long life is in the right hand. So when you start to get educated, so this is, this is a mandate from God. God is saying, get your degree, get educated, Yes, Jesus is coming soon, but don't stop your life. Start to learn about some things. And here it says, in the right hand will be riches and honor. In the left hand, her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. So here we see, in the right hand, long life. In the left hand, riches and honor. And here's, here's the problem with Christians today. It seems as if knowing God and reading the Bible is mutually exclusive from actually getting a degree and learning about science. It's like all of a sudden we look at dinosaurs and carbon-14 dating and all of a sudden we turn off God because somehow science didn't explain the Bible. Well, let me propose to you that the deeper you go in science and understand things like carbon-14 dating and the history of the dinosaurs, and things like space research and astrophysics, that all those things actually point you to a loving creator. But you can't stop at the surface. You actually have to go down deep. You have to start studying physics, chemistry, biochemistry. You have to start um, studying um, things like astrophysics. And you know, here's the thing. The more educated you get, the more humble you get. Because you begin to realize that you don't know everything. You see, the person who knows everything normally is a person that refuses to read, a person who refuses to study. Because you see, they get everything that they know from Wikipedia, right? This is how they gain all their knowledge, is they go online and they, they, they Google it. How about do your own research? Because here we see that when we seek wisdom and knowledge, you will have a tree of life to those who lay hold of her, those who hold her fast, will be called blessed. So let's take a look at these blessings. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. So he's doing a comparison. By understanding, he established the heavens. So it was through the Lord's application of the wisdom where he founded the earth. It was his understanding of all the sciences where he established all the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps broke open and the clouds dropped dew from heaven. My son, do not lose sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and discretion, and they will be life for your soul and adornment for your neck. So here we notice that when you start to achieve certain things in, in knowledge, you start to achieve life for your soul. This is why I'm a big advocate of not just saying, hey, you have cancer, we're going to pray and anoint you, and you should be good. No, you need to go to a physician and learn what kind of a prognosis you have and start using modern medicine together with your faith so that way you can provide a solution. How many people could have lived to today, but they succumbed to things because they said, I'm just going to have faith in God and I don't trust in modern medicine. That's ridiculous. 
God gave us this wisdom. Use modern medicine. Use what we know in the sciences and use them to prolong your life so you can keep proclaiming God's good news. So it's important that we learn some things and that we couple it with our faith. Amen? Now, there's other blessings. Look at what it says here, verse 23. Then you will walk on your way securely and your foot will not stumble. How many of us walk the pathway of life and we're not certain. We stumble in life. If you lie down, you will not be afraid. How many of us are fearful of the unknown? You know, when I was growing up, um, I used to be afraid of the dark. Did you know that the house that we lived on in the ranch was actually haunted? There were actually spirits there, and they would move the furniture around, and I would hear um, things on, on the roof, and my dad would say, oh, it's just the cats. Well, that was the loudest cat I ever heard walk in. You know, it was crazy. Some crazy things I've seen in my life. I think it's, uh, this happened because, because the adversary knew where me and my brother and my family was headed. That we would be used by God in such a way that, that he was trying to put fear. But here's the thing. My dad taught me the ways of God. He taught me not to be afraid. And so guess what? We would, I would be sleeping and I would hear the noises in the, in the kitchen. And I would hear all the, the pans crash down to the floor. I actually heard the crashing pans. So I'd go out there and I'd look and all the pans were right there. Nothing fell. And every time I heard something, you think I was afraid? No. I wasn't afraid. I, I actually, it was so awesome because look at what it says. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. That's almost like a rhyme, man. Your sleep will be sweet. How many of you would love to have sleep that is sweet because you have no fear? You see, when you follow God and you know the ways of God, and you know that God is powerful, and you know that there's this battle on the planet, and you know that you're protected by God, you can endure some things, and you won't be afraid of the dark. You won't be afraid at night. I told you the story. Um, you know, my mom, she's from Hawaii, and um, um, they're very superstitious on the islands. And so my mom, um, she, she grew up in that kind of culture of superstition, and it, it was through faith in God that broke all of those fears. But sometimes at night, my mom still gets a little freaked out, you know, especially when someone dies, like when my dad passed away. So, um, so in my house, I have one of those remote lights, okay? It, it operates on a remote control. It's a, free, a radio frequency. So I can turn my light off and on with a little remote, okay? And um, when you walk down, sometimes um, the light will come on by itself because it's the same frequency as my neighbor's garage door opener, okay? <laughs> So I thought about playing a trick on my mom one day, having her go upstairs, and I'll sit there and, and press my garage door opener and have the light come on. But then I thought, no, that'd be too cruel on my mom. Okay, but here, I'm using this, this, this illustration. You see, I know that the light comes on because of radio frequency, knowledge. But to a person that is all superstitious and voodoo, taboo, tarot card kind of person, that would freak a person out. You see how lack of knowledge would make a person's way insecure, where it would cause them to stumble, where their lack of knowledge of how things work in, in thermodynamics and physics of gravitation, how these things can make you lose sleep at night and you'd be afraid because you all of a sudden think about spirits and demons and stuff like this. God says, don't be a fool. Learn some things because there are some things in the natural world that Satan is using to fool you. And so here we see, do not be, verse 25, afraid of sudden terror or of the ruin of the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. And this is so true today. Everyone is talking about aliens coming from, from, from the universe and they're going to come to our planet. You know, Hollywood has been, been prepping everyone's mind about aliens forever. And so guess what? Maybe Satan is going to come as an alien saying, I came here 6,000 years ago and I planted my DNA in the waters of earth and you are my children. I am Jesus Christ the Messiah and millions will believe it because they don't know scripture. They don't know that, um, that Lucifer, Satan, knows science better than you. So this is why I advocate get educated. Learn some things so that way you will have confidence and you can sleep at night because you know that God is a God that is all-powerful and he created all these things. Amen? All right, meaningful relationships, the last one. 
Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due. How many of you want to have a really awesome relationship with your neighbor, your friend, your coworker, all of these meaningful relationships? Okay, here's what God says. If you want to have a meaningful relationship, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due. In other words, if you have the ability, make it happen. Do it. Okay? When it is in your power to do it, do it. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come back again tomorrow and I will give it. When you have it with you right now. And this is why I really advocate for world missions. If you have the ability to go into the inner city and, and provide for the needy, then do it. Make it happen. And you will discover that you will start to form meaningful relationships around those who are doing it with you and those who you are helping. By the way, are you going back to Ukraine in July? He's going back in July. Did you make some friends there? He made friends there. How long were you there? One week. One week. He was there for one week and he made meaningful relationships. Why? Because when he had the ability to provide a good, he didn't hold back and he gave it and it created a meaningful relationship. World missions are important and helping your neighbor is important. Do not plan evil against your neighbor. That goes without saying. Okay, now we shouldn't plan evil against our neighbor, but how many times do we do it? How many times do we want to get back? You know, I used to, I used to be that kind of guy that, um, man, you know, my neighbor is just is messed up. Always messing up and always complaining all the time. Turning me into the HOA, you know what I'm saying? Because you have your car out there, you're changing your tire, you have a, you have a, a, a trailer out there. That you all laugh because you all belong to HOAs, apparently, and you got turned in. Okay? And then all of a sudden you think, well, what can I do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to my kid and see if we still got some of those rotten eggs. No. I'm not going to do that. But what do you do? You start thinking badly about that person. You start thinking evil about your neighbor. God says, do not plan evil against your neighbor who dwells trustingly beside you. Do not contend with the man for no reason when he has done you no harm. And look at verse 31. If you want to have meaningful relationships, do not envy a person of violence and do not choose any of his ways. So I'm going to say this to you. If you are in a, a relationship and you're forming and that person is a person of violence, get out quick. Okay? If that person is abusive emotionally and physically, you need to start praying and get out quick. God says, do not envy that person of violence. Do not choose any of his ways. For the devious person is an abomination to the Lord, but the upright are in his confidence. Amen? Amen. This is tough because nowadays people are making choices and then they only discover the dark side afterwards. Maybe you need to spend a little time and be patient and learn the dark side before you jump all in. And when you start to see the dark come out, start taking note. Red flags start going up and don't get your heart to, into that person. You got to start building some, some walls. Start relying on your friends and your family because your family, I can tell you one thing for sure. Those of you who know, you know this to be true. Friends come and go, but your family is blood and they will stay with you all the way through the end. Now, some of you have family that have written you off. And some of you have family that said, I don't want to have anything to do with you. If you are that person, you have another family. They're sitting around you. You have another family, and that is the Father in heaven. Your brother is Jesus. He is our forefather. So you still have a family, and God will never fail. Amen? So the Bible goes on in verse 33, and we're going to close it out here. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Toward the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. The wise will inherit honor, but fools will get disgrace. So as we look at wisdom and knowledge, and finally this idea of building meaningful relationships, the Lord is saying here that if you want to be blessed, if you want to be righteous, then be in the house of God. Learn about God. Learn about his laws. Learn about his, his ways. Towards the scorners, he is scornful. But if you are humble, God will give you favor. Amen? How do we find God's purpose? One, seek and listen for God in every moment. How do we find God's purpose? 
We find God's purpose by surrendering to God. Not relying on your own understanding, but relying on God. Knowing that the greatest wisdom is to know God much deeper. You see, we often judge God because we only think of God from what we hear. How about discovering God for yourself? Don't listen to what your grandparents or your parents say. You need to discover God for yourself because your parents and your grandparents aren't going to save you. So you have to journey on your own. You have to discover God and the wisdom that he can give you, and you can discover God's purpose for you. Amen? Amen. Finally, what would be the result? When you come to God and you listen to God, you surrender to God, you'll discover that heaven will teach you, will touch you, and, he'll, and God will teach you things that you need to know to give you a purpose-driven life. This morning, I'm going to ask you all a question. How many of you here are willing to seek and listen for God? Amen. How many of you want to be touched by God? Yes. If you want to be touched, if you want to seek and have God as your friend, God asks us to surrender to him. God asks us to find him and find his purpose for us. Proverbs tells us that if you're willing to surrender, if you're willing to seek God, if you're willing to open yourself to God, then you can have all of these desires of your heart. How many of you want to do that this morning. I'm going to ask the AV team to turn down the lights in the house. And as the uh, worship team begins to play, I'm going to invite the uh, young adult prayer team to come up now. And uh, they're going to stand in the front here. And I'm going to ask those of you who want to know God and would want to know what God's purpose is to come up and we're going to pray for you. We're going to pray with you that as you open your heart to God, that God will meet you and that he will touch you. As the worship team sings, I'm going to ask those of you who are being moved by the Spirit to come forward now, and we're going to pray with you at this time.